that, I would like to tell you a little bit about our guest speaker this evening. Senator Sarah K. Elfrith is uh, a Democrat member of Maryland Senate and representing the 30th District, Annapolis and Southern Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel County. She serves on the Senate Budget and Taxation Committee as one of two Maryland senators on the Tri-State Chesapeake Bay Commission. Elfrith serves as an adjunct professor at Towson University's Honors College, which I believe she just came from. Uh, Sarah is from Barrington, New Jersey, and she attended Towson University, received a BA in political science, was a student regent at University System of Maryland, Maryland Board of Regents, and is also has a master's in public policy from the Johns Hopkins University. Do you say the, like they do at the George Washington University? Oh, they are um, very serious about the, 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 the and the S, yes. Yeah, the Johns Hopkins University, where she worked as research assistant in the Office of Government and Community Affairs. And she is also, fun fact, was a past staffer with the National Aquarium in Baltimore. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce Senator Sarah Elfrith. Well, thank you so much, Brian, and thank you, Tom. And it's good to see um, a couple of folks uh, that I work with, and I would love to see more faces because this is always awkward if I'm just talking at at screen so if folks want to turn their camera on that'd be great um but it's good to see john poppin who i was just with last week at the thomas point lighthouse jim martin who you know is just a stalwart campaign volunteer and member of our community so it's good to see everybody here um i there's a thousand directions um, oh matt minahan of course is wonderful um a thousand directions i can go for this talk i think i'll start maybe um with oysters because this group uh, just such a such an incredible job as citizen advocates, citizen scientists, um, and moving the ball forward in terms of our oyster population, increasing our oyster population. So let's let's start with oysters. I spent my Thursday at Horn Point, um, part of part of UMSI's, as folks here know. I have a pretty interesting history with Horn Point because, as, as Brian mentioned, I had been I had served on the board of regents for the University of Sister of Maryland when I was in college, and so in that role, um, I, I had probably the least fun senior year of any senior year of college possible, but I got to travel around the state, work with university presidents, work with students, um, hire and fire university presidents, but but really understand our university system in a, in a deep way that is really beneficial now that I serve on the Senate's Budget Taxation Committee um, because I serve on the Education Subcommittee, which funds higher education, and I serve on the Capital Budget Subcommittee, which pays for new buildings for higher ed and everything else. Um, and I serve on the Chesapeake Bay Commission, as Brian mentioned. So a lot of my work, um, I like to think, has you know one foot in the budget because that's my my primary job as my standing committee assignment of working on passing a balanced budget every year that reflects our priorities as a community and as a state. But my other foot is is squarely in environmental policy um, because of my background working for the aquarium, my work on the Chesapeake Bay Commission. And frankly, it's what my district cares the most about. So there are 47 Senate districts in the state of Maryland. This is the only Senate district, well, if you live in 30, uh, like Jim and John and a couple other people here, um, where the environment holds as the number one most important issue to our community consistently. And I'd like to believe it's because we are truly blessed to live here um, and we understand kind of inherently our deep obligation to make sure it's here for generations to come. So I really try my best to focus on um, a lot of environmental policy and environmental budgetary work in my time in the Senate. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the environmental wins from last year and maybe a look ahead at this upcoming legislative session. But, but let's start with oysters because um, they're incredibly important as this group knows all too well to the health of the Bay. And yet we're at you know anywhere between one and two percent of historic population levels as this group knows all too well um it was one of the first bills i worked on when i got to the senate in 2019 um speaker bush who was with us at the time oh betsy it's good to see you too um speaker bush who was with us at the time um also cared deeply about about oysters as this group knows and his one of his bills his his last session with us and actually the bill we we voted to override the governor's veto on the day after he passed away, was to permanently put into sanctuary status the five restoration tributaries uh, in the state. And you probably read about the Minokin in the news of late, um, some craziness going on on the Eastern shore, but ultimately um, Maryland is committed to restoring five oyster sanctuaries, Virginia's committed 
and we are well on our way to accomplishing that goal. But we also had, as this group knows, 46 other sanctuaries across the, the Bay that were not part of the five large restoration projects, but still have a lot of ecological benefit. Severn River being one of them, um, the Herring Bay in the southernmost part of my district being another, the South River in my district being another. So oysters just happen to be really important to this district. So I stepped in my, my freshman of freshman years um, and worked on a bill to revamp the Oyster Advisory Commission and bring together watermen and advocates and scientists and force them to be in the same room together and work out their differences. It was an experiment that worked really well in the little chop tank on the Eastern shore um, in a project that had some really great conditions for it, frankly. It was a smaller project. They had incredible facilitators um, that, that really worked to bring the two sides together. And at the end of the day, they came out with a consensus product of how to handle that fisheries management plan for Little Chop Tank. So I heard about this even before I was sworn in. I think Dylan, who's with me, is on my staff. Dylan and I were at a meeting with the Advocates for Herring Bay at the uh, Annapolis Neck Library. They were kind enough to come up here to meet um, but it was in between that weird time where I had been elected but not sworn in yet. And they told me about this project in the little chop tank um, and said, wouldn't it be cool if we did it for Herring Bay? And so I called the scientist at, at UMSI's, um, Dr. Elizabeth North, and I said, wouldn't it be cool if we did this for Herring Bay? And she said, wouldn't it be cool if we did it for the whole bay? And that's how um, my first veto happened. I uh, worked with uh, advocates, the scientists, the watermen, UMSI's, everybody, to put together this new Oyster Advisory Commission, um, gave them two years, gave them a moderator. Unfortunately, we did not have the best moderator um, and gave them the mission of coming up with a consensus based fisheries management plan for the rest of for not for the rest of time, but certainly for the near future. Um, unfortunately, you know, you, we make plans and God laughs and we pass laws and a pandemic happens. And the very heart of this the idea was that we could get two people, two groups of people who couldn't agree on what's up or down um, to be in the same room together and humanize one another and uh, use the best science we have available and, you know, talented moderators to, to bring these sides together. Um, we couldn't do that in a pandemic. And frankly, um, the, the political climate got worse over the last couple of years. And I'm, I don't want to talk too much about politics in this space, but, um, you know, we had a lot of attacks of science in the last couple of years, be it um, public health related science or environmental science. Um, and, and people's temperatures just got, got up. Um, I, we, all, we all reacted to COVID in different ways. Um, none of those ways in this circumstance were helpful for building consensus and for people to listen to one another. So unfortunately, the Oyster Advisory Commission just finished its work last week and, and didn't come up with anything earth shattering. Um, but it also didn't come up with anything harmful. It didn't come up with anything that said, hey, we're going to start opening up the 46 other sanctuaries like the Severn for um, for wild harvest. So we at least held the line for a couple of years and started the conversation and got to a little bit of consensus. Where we go from here on oysters is really important. I, I spent a lot of work on this. Um, I was down in Virginia two weeks ago with the Bay Commission working with watermen in Virginia. Um, and they have just, you know, I'm sure this group knows, just the ideal set of circumstances. They just throw shell into rivers and spat naturally comes. It's, I mean, it's something to be jealous of. Um, but the, after that, going to Horn Point and working with, with them, um, working with CERC. So we are going to have a bill on one thing that we can all agree on is that we need more spat. And we need to increase production of and supply of spat to successfully you know, uh, plant in the, the five sanctuaries, tributaries that we have, to make sure that you as a, as a community association and a, a river association can have as much spat as you frankly want. Every year, I know Tom knows this, but every year everybody sits at the table uh, when it comes to horn porn spat and the watermen get a certain percentage and aquaculture gets a certain percentage, sanctuaries get a certain percentage and folks like you and folks like Advocates for Herring Bay kind of get whatever's left over. Um, and if we have a really good year for spat, which we've had, thankfully, these last couple of years, at least two years at least, of about two billion spat on shell produced, you know, people get a little bit, everybody walks away a little happy, a little, a little upset, but you're going to get something. Well, what if we increase that production? 
Um, and we have but you pull on one lever, something else breaks over here. But let's increase production. So we're going to have a bill this year that is going to do a couple of things. It's going to put more money into Horn Point. It's a 20 year old facility. And I know this all too well, having worked at the aquarium. Um, salt water is uh, the enemy of any built environment. And so they have a lot of critical maintenance upkeep uh, ahead of them. Um, so if we invest a little bit of money into helping them with that critical maintenance, they believe they can increase their spat production by 30% in the next year or two. So immediate jump in spat production for, for everybody. Um, but what if we invested more? What if we built a second horn point? What if we um, revamped our shell recycling tax credit so that we are getting more shell back into the system? What if we provided uh, uh, tax credits for shucking houses to come back to Maryland and then recapture and reuse the shell from those shucking houses? The watermen for years have been begging me to pass a bill to increase the bushel tax, and it's the governor who refuses to do it. He hates anything that looks like a tax. In this case, the purchasing power and weight of that tax, because it's an excise tax and it hasn't been increased in 20 years, is, is, is disproportionate to what they need. So what if we provided a funding mechanism in this bill by increasing the bushel tax? So those, oh, and another piece to it that uh, we're, we're very serious about is uh, funding um, innovative research for substrate. Another thing that we war about, you know, alternative substrate, the watermen want more shell and only shell and want to dredge man of war shoal. Advocates want to use, you know, the best science and technology to figure out the best substrate for a specific, uh, for a specific area. We, we need to come together. And frankly, we need to do a better job of sharing information between Maryland and Virginia because we're both doing innovative things and we can learn a lot from one another. The point being, I could nerd out about oysters all night, as I'm sure this group can as well. Um, but please know uh, I am working on um, we're just calling the omnibus oyster bill right now. And then, you know, when we have a new governor and a new DNR in the next year, I think we can make a lot more progress. But we're trying to find ways to be productive with the set of circumstances, political circumstances we have right now. So that's that's really um, a big bill I'm going to carry next year. Next year being two months from now. Um, Brian, could you put, this is crazy, can you put uh, the graphic up on screen and I'll talk about some wins we had for the environment last year and then I'll talk about um, the opportunities we have in front of us. Tom, you, you said you had it. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Okay. Okay. So uh, it was a, a pretty decent year for the environment. I'll take you back a couple of years though. We had a great win in 2019 with the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Uh, if you recall, that that has a goal of getting us to 50% of renewable energy as a state by 2030, and then studying how to get to 100% thereafter. Um, we are really in a good place there. I'm sure you've read in the news that that um, Orsted and and U.S. Wind um, are are really active and already building new steel and manufacturing plants in Maryland with union wage jobs, which is really exciting. That's the exact thing we wanted with that bill. So that's well on its way. Um, so that was a big win kind of right out of the gate for this term. And then we kept going. So last year was a, was a pretty good year as a whole. Um, folks I know on this call helped advocate for the Climate Solutions Now Act that Senator Pinsky put in. Unfortunately, there was, there was some um, unnecessary tension between the House and the Senate on that bill. But ultimately, we were able to salvage, even though the whole bill didn't pass, um, and the meat of the bill, which has to do with greenhouse gas emissions, didn't pass. We were able to pull out two really important pieces of that bill um, that are going to move us forward. So I'll start at the bottom of this graphic uh, because one of those pieces is planting more trees and not just planting more trees, but planting them in better places. So um, we pulled out the tree section that I had the honor of working on and, and passed it in its own bill to plant 5 million trees over the next 10 years and making sure we are planting them both on agricultural land where they have great value um, and reforestation opportunities. And the innovation here was, um, I happened to read an article in the Bay Journal about uh, the, the Bay Foundation working with community groups in Richmond, Virginia in communities that had been historically underserved and overburdened and had no tree canopy. And this group knows the results of that are higher temperatures and heat island effects, um, worse stormwater mitigation, um, worse air quality. 
So I took that tiny idea of Richmond and we put it into this bill where we're 10% of the money we're spending um, is, or sorry, 10% of the trees planted will be in um, overburdened communities. And we defined that through a couple of lenses um, of the communities that had been historically redlined, communities that have a high percentage of unemployment and um, communities that are well beneath the, the um, median income here in Maryland. And then um, I kind of slipped in at the last minute, public housing communities, because that's what's gonna benefit certainly Annapolis and, and communities across the state. So really focusing our tree planting on those communities that I'm, I'm trying to create a trend to call them under treed. So if you could help me start calling communities that don't have enough tree canopy under treed, um, we can make we can turn the tide on on planting trees. So really happy that the Chesapeake Bay Trust is is implementing that piece, that equity piece of the program. And Jana Davis has already hit the ground running on that, and it's very exciting. Um, so that was a big a big bill this year. We also passed uh, a, the second piece we pulled out of clean energy, sorry, of climate solutions now was the goal and um, beginning of electrifying the state fleet of vehicles. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we have the greenhouse gas emissions piece that we still need to take up this upcoming session. And I, I feel confidently that we can do that. Um, a couple of other wins from last year for the environment. I'll, keep, I'll go up from, from bottom up. Um, Maryland has a, a commission on environmental justice that's supposed to meet regularly, be representative of communities that are underserved and have experienced historic injustices when it comes to the environment. In my district, um, that means places like Lothian that have a tremendous amount of landfill and traffic because of, of uh, certain companies down there um, and disproportionate public health impacts because of, um, frankly, really poor permitting and zoning. Um, so we have these communities across the state. Think about the Eastern Shore and chicken farms. Think about communities that surround coal burning fire, uh, coal burning power plants. And we we have a commission that's supposed to be talking about those issues and then recommending to the General Assembly ways that we can turn the, their tide on that. That commission wasn't meeting regularly. Um, it was not representative of the communities it was seeking to serve, and it didn't have the tools it needed to actually make recommendations of substance to the General Assembly. So. I had the privilege of working on that bill last year. It was part of um, the Senate president had put together a work group on equity and inclusion that I served on. And that was a big piece for us of how are we gonna elevate these very important issues of environmental justice and injustice um, to, a, to a level that, you know, frankly, the policymakers start hearing and start acting on. So really happy with that bill that passed. Um, uh, Senate Bill 324 is a bill we've spent two years working to pass. It, um, really started because I, I was you know, door knocking uh, around Lake Ogleton and a ton of people um, were seeing, you know, chocolate milk, coffee colored water in Lake Ogleton because of uh, various development projects around the, the watershed, yet no one could find the violations and no one seemed to be responsible for enforcement. And we, this group knows better than anybody, we have some pretty solid environmental um, laws on the books, but but definitely not enough enforcement and certainly not enough transparency in that enforcement that is going to give you as individuals and this group as a whole confidence in those laws. And so I work with Delegate Brooke Learman from Baltimore City on this bill for two years. Um, you could, if you sense there was a violation happening, let's say around Lake Ogleton, you could put in a Maryland Public Information Act request and wait 60 days for the various state agency to respond to you, which doesn't seem particularly transparent. Um, or what we did here, and we joined the vast amount of base states in doing this, Maryland's just gonna publish those. So you can actually see them in, in not in real time, but soon after. So that information is publicly available to you and we can start holding our government more responsible and more accountable for enforcement. Um, so I like to think about that as like a, a democratizing of this data that is certainly not the panacea here, but it is an important component of greater enforcement and greater um, confidence in our laws. So happy with that bill. Um, so that's for MGE, um, DNR and DNR, um, which is really important. Okay, and then um, the last bill I'll talk about that I also sponsored is this top one the stormwater management review and update uh, bill, and you probably saw the article in the Capitol this last week. Um, 
I was shocked to learn uh, after a couple of, of good news reports that the data Maryland was using to uh, inform our stormwater regulation standards was from the early 90s. And I, I'm allowed to joke about my age. I was in grade school. And that data, as we all know here, is no longer accurate or representative of, of the storms that we are seeing now. Um, we are seeing um, much more intense storms, um, shorter periods of time, um, but, but higher uh, degree of, of rainfall in that time. And so we are just overwhelming our built environment and our stormwater management systems time and again. So we put in a bill to do something really simple to say, hey, Maryland Department of Environment, you need to update that data immediately and then every five years thereafter. And then you need to change your stormwater regulation standards based on that new data and those new storms. So we passed that bill. I work with Delegate Sarah Love from Montgomery County on that bill. And just last week, MDE came out with a new set of data and a new plan moving forward. So pretty exciting um, uh, for that to, to come to real time. And now I can't joke that our data is from when I was in grade school because now it's from my third year in the Senate. So those are some of the bills from last year. Oh, one more I think this group will care about is we added to our renewable portfolio standard um, geothermal, which is pretty exciting. So uh, that's that's a great a great win for the environment there. Okay, um, Tom, you could stop sharing if you'd like, and I can talk briefly about what's ahead. And then I really want to answer questions because I am a professor for a living outside of the Senate, and I, I hate lecturing. So um, we'll make this interactive. Okay, what I see is as up ahead. Um, certainly that greenhouse gas emissions bill I mentioned, so it'll probably sound something like the, the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022, but I think um, we are, as we all know, experiencing in real time um, climate change happening around us much faster than we anticipated. So there's a great deg degree of urgency on that bill. Um, I mentioned the oyster bill I'll be working on. I'll have a smaller invasive plants bill that um, is going to, Delaware passed something similar this last year. It's going to help us um, hopefully ban the sale of really invasive plants by better identifying what they are and then prohibiting Maryland from, in our procurement system, from um, using those invasive plants on our own state projects. Uh, two pieces of land preservation and park issues. I, the Senate President asked me to co-chair the State Parks Investment Commission, so I'm working with Delegate Eric Lukey from Montgomery County and former Governor Paris Glenn Denning. This has also been in the news quite a bit. Um, a silver lining of, of COVID is that many folks, I'm sure no one in this group, but many folks rediscovered our state parks and green spaces. We saw a 45% increase in um, state park visitation in, in 2020. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is we have historically and governor after governor, regardless of party, underinvested in our state parks. Um, we have some infrastructure that was built uh, under FDR and not maintained since then. So we have an approximate $70 million backlog of deferred maintenance in our existing parks. Um, and that doesn't even count the parks that we have technically publicly open, but in no way invested in. For instance, um, Franklin Point State Park in Shadyside in the bottom of my district, um, is technically open, but um, not well maintained and shares a park ranger with Sandy Point State Park, which makes not a bit of sense from a geographic perspective. Um, we also, from a staffing side, so that's kind of the capital needs, the staffing side, we used to have a ratio of one ranger or staff person per 35,000 visitors. Um, we're now at one per 85,000. So they are just overworked, underpaid, can we make way more money and frankly leave us for the National Park Service, County Park Service. We have a lot of work ahead of us. So we've been meeting uh, for the last three months with stakeholders, public hearings, and have come out with 40 different recommendations for our state parks and way too many recommendations for me to tell you about here. But on all of, to address all of the issues I just spoke about, um, to address creating a better and frankly more diverse and representative pipeline of park rangers and park staff, addressing staffing, not just in the ranger side, but also internally at DNR, um, increasing the staffing in their acquisition to actually execute program open space in a faster manner, um, staffing at their uh, construction um, and project level to make sure that we're, if we're gonna give them a lot of money, they need to start 
you know, shovel ready projects quickly. Um, and we also have some some good stuff in there about uh, climate and, and resiliency as well. So uh, focusing on um, building out green infrastructure as well, particularly in the parks that are closest to watersheds. So we can also get added environmental benefits and, and move closer to the our WIP goals through our state park land. So 40 recommendations. Um, we'll, we will have a draft report for the public on November 30th. And then we will, uh, so we have a kind of a draft report that we talked about in our last meeting. We'll make a vote on our final report. It's out for comment right now on November 30th. And then I will be sponsoring the bills to put those into action in the next section. session. So I can't put numbers on it right now because they might scare you, but please expect a um, once in a generation investment in our state parks moving forward uh, that I'm really, really excited about. Um, and that kind of leads to another related bill we're working on. Um, President Biden set out a goal of achieving 30% um, of our country's land in, 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 in preservation by 2030. It turned out Maryland is actually pretty close to that goal. We're about 27% of our land, but we have a lot more to go. Um, so we are, ha we are working on a bill, uh, just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna call it 30 by 30 to preserve 30% of Maryland land by 30, 2030, but then um, plan for how do we get, how do we preserve 40% by 2040? And we're gonna do that through a couple of mechanisms. One is to create a green space equity program to make sure that we are preserving um, land in green spaces and communities that frankly have not received that, that benefit before. Um, we are going to put money into forward funding land acquisition in a faster manner. Um, this group knows that program open space takes, um, it's a bureaucratic institution, takes a tremendous amount of time to actually put into place. So we're gonna create some, um, some bridge funding mechanisms for groups like yourself, if you so chose to get into land preservation, to forward fund some of those projects and acquisitions. Um, and then a couple of other forestry pieces, but that 30 by 30 bill, uh, if we can achieve it, will be the first state in the country to actually put into action President Biden's goals for land preservation. Um, I'll have a couple of other bills. I have one about solar panels um, on, on uh, multi-housing, uh, multi affordable multi-housing buildings. Um, I'm sure Dylan will chat me things that I've missed along the way. I traditionally over-prescribe and have about 25 bills. Um, that's because I, I'm gonna be chairing the Bay Commission. I chair the Pension Subcommittee, the Senate delegation. Um, there are fewer senators, so much more work to go around. With that, I will take a beat, take a drink of water and answer any questions folks may have for me. Thank you, Senator Elfrith. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, we have a small enough group that I think we can um, slowly come off mute and ask questions. When we have bigger groups, I ask it to go into the chat box. If you're not comfortable talking on the mic and camera, you can put it in the chat box as well. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. And um, I, have, oh, I have a question too, but I'll save it. I do, Brent, I totally forgot because it's been a very long day. I started my day in Baltimore today at the Blue Tech Conference talking about um, opportunities to invest more in blue technology companies throughout the state. And I spoke this morning about this bill and I didn't do it here. Um, I will be the sponsor of the Conservation Financing Act that is going to kind of cut some bureaucratic red tape and eventually lead to a greater private investment in um, our restoration and conservation goals. So that's gonna be another big big piece of legislation I'm working on with um, former Secretary DNR John Griffin and also our Annapolis neighbor. Awesome. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, Sarah has a hard out at eight o'clock because her day does not end with this meeting. She has more work to do this evening. So we're going to respect her time and, and try to be out of here at 7.55 at the latest. So with that, I open the floor for questions for Senator Sarah. I apologize. I have to meet with a group for, from South County next. So it's a big district. Uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, hi, good to see you. Great hearing what you're working on. Three quick questions. Are you happy with the results of the flush tax and what's happening there? Yeah. Um, okay. uh, what, why is the state so slow in enforcing its um, runoff regulations on the chicken farms and what can you guys do about that? Yeah. I mean, you've got the regulations and the agencies are not enforcing them. Yeah. And uh, the third one is, um, 
you seem like the perfect wonk, and <laughs> I'm just wondering if you're really loving this job. Okay, I'm gonna start with two, and then I'll go one, and then three, because that's the hardest. So two, uh, chicken farm. So this is, um, I don't wanna be partisan, because it's not just Governor Hogan. Let's be clear, I, I think Governor O'Malley is, was also to blame um, with his lack of enforcement. This is what happens when we constrain any growth of government in order to not raise any taxes, which is a fair thing to do. Um, but at this moment, sitting here today, Maryland has 6,800 vacancies in state government, not counting higher education. So we have starved government and um, the worst hit have been DNR and MDE. And we're seeing that in real time from lack of enforcement. So beyond like political will of choosing what to enforce and what not, we do not have this staff. So that's a great challenge right now that, you know, I, I serve on the budget committee, so I know this very well. Um, you know, the governor gives us his budget. At this moment, we only have the opportunity to cut the budget. We cannot add to the budget. Um, so our hands are a bit tied, but it's one thing I'm really looking forward to working with the next governor on is, you know, we cannot grow government by 7,000 employees you know, tomorrow, but um, the state has grown. Um, our challenges have grown. You know, we've made, I didn't mention this before, but, you know, we've made tremendous progress on, on achieving, you know, uh, our goals in protecting the Bay, despite, you know, huge development over the last 40 years and a growing population over the last 40 years. But now we picked all that low hanging fruit and, and we have an additional challenge of climate change and that threat to the Bay. So like we're facing challenges that 40 years ago we couldn't have imagined and we're doing it with far fewer state employees to actually address these challenges so um it's a complex issue as you know matt but if i had to pick like the one thing that will turn the tide on that it's going to be increasing enforcement staff at mde Got it. now Thank you. your your yeah your your bay restoration fund question because that was a fight um as you probably read in the paper so I have the great privilege of working with a lot of environmental ad advocacy groups around the state and building friendships with folks. And when they see something go wrong, um, typically they text me, <laughs> maybe during a hearing. Um, so that's kind of what happened. If you saw the, the news in the paper, the governor and Secretary Grumbles uh, sought to use $13 million in Bay Restoration Fund money last year to pay a a, a processing plant that takes um, all of the leftovers of chicken parts and processes that into um, animal food. Um, and that company had uh, was operating on a zombie permit from 2008, had significant um, history of noncompliance, both with MDE and with, uh, with EPA. Um, and uh, their CEO just happened to be bragging about how many millions of dollars and revenue he has that he doesn't even know like how to give it to his kids. Um, and this is the company that we were going to give a $13 million, no strings attached gift to, not a loan, which I have no problem um, using the revolving loan fund for this kind of activity, particularly in the private sector. We were gonna give them a $13 million grant. And um, some folks on the Eastern shore called me and said, have you seen this in the budget? And I got, I don't normally get emotional or, or like hot about stuff, but I got really, I got really angry about it. And I just so happened to be invited to a meeting um, with uh, the chair of education, and health and environmental Com committee, uh, Senator Pinsky, that he was having with Secretary Grumbles about the Climate Solutions Now Act that was gonna use some BRF money. And so I just, you know, I had promised, you know, I was not the senior senator in that room, um, but when the secretary starts talking about, we can't possibly pass Climate Solutions Now, because we have a limited BRF and all of these important projects that we need to fund, I shot up like a rocket and said, uh, then why are we giving a $13 million gift to a company that is significantly out of compliance and polluting the Eastern shore? And that kicked off a floor fight over this. Um, it kicked off a, a fight in the budget back room. We were able to cut, I had wanted to cut it entirely, <laughs> um, all of that money and give it to projects that were frankly more worthy. Uh, I was able to get that money cut back to 50% of the project. So from 13 million, we got to cut back to seven and a half million um, and, you know, called that a win. And um, then put into the, I'm getting really technical, I apologize. We put into the BRFA, which is the Budget Reconciliation and Financing Act, which does have the power of, of, of law, um, 
that moving forward, the BRF could not be used to fund more than 50% of any private project. So that's now law. So that was a result of that. The latest uh, in that issue is uh, that CEO who claimed and bragged to the Washington Post about having so much money he didn't know what to do with it, now claims um, they're not gonna do this project because we didn't give them all the money and they're just not gonna do it and they're returning, they're not even gonna take any of the money we put aside for them. So long story short, you asked about B BRF. Um, we have some cleanup to do now. So we put the 50% language in. Um, we are working right now with Chesapeake Legal Alliance. So it's gonna be a smaller bill. And when I say smaller, I think it's one of my favorites because I think it's like six words that we're adding to the law. So it's, it's one of those great bills. Um, to make clear that uh, we're only going to fund projects that have a significant public interest. Um, so, you know, we don't want to discount projects, uh, again, like my my constituents in Lothian who are in living in mobile home parks who are on septic. Well, it's kind of reasonable for us to use BRF to tie them into the system as long as it has a broader public benefit. And we are defining that, I believe, as, as 50 residences or greater. So we want to keep that funding focused on the public good it was intended to to fund and not on frankly, you know, kickbacks for millionaires. So we're working on that. Um you asked me if I love my job. I do. <laughs> if you can't tell I get really excited about this stuff. Um I have the ability to make a difference and I have a fantastic staff, Dylan's here and and Jennifer who's in my office and um, whether it's this wonky stuff on policy, which I love clearly, or budget stuff, or the most important thing that we do is answer the phone in the office and help people and help people get vaccinated, help people get their unemployment insurance if they lost their jobs last year, help um, you know throw some elbows on Betsy's behalf to get her permits cleared for St. Luke's. Um, you know that's that's my my job is to pick up the phone and call you know the mayor or the attorney general or the governor's office and and you know, nine times out of 10, they're gonna pick up and nine times out of 10, we can fix a problem. So I really love my job. I'm, I'm really tired <laughs> just because I teach on top of this, I'm actively campaigning and my, I'll be up for election next year. I don't have an opponent yet, but I am um, working my tail off to make sure that if I do, I am successful because I love what I do. So I'm raising a lot of money and knocking a lot of doors and spending a lot of time um, happily uh but very exhaustedly married to the senate so thanks so much for this answer and for all, all you're doing for us well, thank great you. to see S senator Elfrith, can you this is betsy mm -hmm. can you, i just wanted to say if i could clone you <laughs> i would <laughs> we have to figure out a way to clone you because the work you do is so important and you're, you know, you're just so effective at your job. And, and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your um, being in my, um, my corner when I need you. And um, I'm hoping very much if there's anything that you, that you need at all in your uh, reelection campaign, we'll be there for you. Well, thank you. That means a lot. I love my job. I think it's the best job in the world. And I, I really want to keep it. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I saw a chat uh, from Steve. I spoke about state parks funding. Uh, we're also advocating for state and local funding for bike paths in the Annapolis area. Yes. So we um, we had a bill a couple of years back, and it didn't pass, but the governor kind of conceded and put money in the budget for a dedicated fund for bike paths um, and bike infrastructure across the state. And that typically is about five to eight million dollars a year. So for the last couple of years, and it's a competitive grant process. And for the last couple of years, um, you know, in great news, Annapolis is, and Anne Arundel County, frankly, have been pretty successful. So um, I can find the funding that was just announced about two months ago, but I think four or five projects are in Anne Arundel County, which is which is pretty great. And and frankly, this group knows we, we need to do more in, in terms of walkability and bikeability um, from many perspectives in notwithstanding, a, you know, a resiliency perspective and, and creating more connected communities. So, you know, God forbid, M Matt gets cut off on the Mayo Peninsula again. You know, we have opportunities 
uh, which will happen. We're, we're community peninsulas. We, we need opportunities for people to get around and for, you know, there to be an emergency response. So yes, we will continue to fund that program. I imagine um, the next governor will also see the value of that program. And I hope he will, or I hope he will, because I don't want the she. I hope he will continue to fund that program and grow that program. And then we are also looking through our State Parks Investment Commission at transportation. So recommending pilot projects with MTA to connect folks to state parks. And also we are recommending building out some connectivity infrastructure for bikeability as well. Can I uh, jump in and ask, um kind of a broad arching question, how voters can be better environmental stewards ah. um, and more involved in your district and in our Seven River watershed? Um, well, exactly what this group does. I wish everybody did this. Um, you know, not just waiting for us to make policy changes, but taking action, particularly on oysters, uh, improving, um, proving proof of concept, which you're doing actively, that yes, the Severn is a viable place to grow oysters and have them thrive. Um, that is so helpful to what we do, especially when I when I don't have the benefit of a very helpful DNR. Um, the work that you're doing and Advocates for Herring Bay are doing and Arundel Rivers Association, that is, um, you are such a value add to the work that we do at the State House. I can't thank you enough. So getting involved there um how to be more active you always 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 reach out to me um and i will give you the time the time that i have i i think i i, I make it a point to meet with anybody who asks for a meeting that meeting might be 15 minutes but that's uh, that's what it is so you know asking for time and understanding we have a lot uh, to balance so i i just talked to you tonight about the environmental issues that we're working on um i have a, a whole slew of other policy priorities that we're working on as well, particularly around women and children and families. It's very really important to me. Um, so understanding that we uh, have to be a mile wide and an inch deep on everything, um, because that's that's the commitment we have to make to be, our, our, the breadth of our communities. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Dylan texted me, of course, because I forgot something. I did forget that I chair the pension subcommittee and I I'm comfortable sharing with this group that we will be making um, responsible strides towards divestment of our pensions from um, climate polluters. A responsible, um, it has to be, it has to be slow, it has to be measured um, for our fiduciary responsibility here. But I think this is going to be a very good year for Maryland to make a statement that we are disproportionately impacted by climate change, and we should not be using our sixty billion dollar pension system to add to that problem. So. Um, I'm telling you before I tell the Senate president that that's what I am recommending, but uh, it's, I just had a, a breakfast with this, the treasurer yesterday and uh, this is a legacy project for her as she leaves her five decades of public service. So we're excited to get this across the finish line as well. And back to oysters, I'm also an oyster nerd working for Oyster Recovery Partnership for many years and love all this. And I'm gonna put, I uh, just in the chat, um, Y'all, if you get a chance to get over to Horn Point Lab in Cambridge, please do so. I just put the link for tours um, between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Tuesday mornings at 10 is kind of an open running invitation for the general public and grad students and sometimes yours truly give to a walking tour of the campus over there. Um, I'm over there in times of non-pandemic uh, as their environmental education specialist doing teacher training, summer camps and professional Hi. development. So um, the, the scale and depth of uh, the technology over there is pretty jaw dropping. So when you see that they do in a good year when Mother Nature Cooperates put out over a billion oysters of spat on shell into our local waterways, um, seeing the sausage made there behind the scenes is, is really impressive. So it's incredible. Um, yeah. that link as well. Uh, I think John's, John, I can't hear you, but. Might have to unplug your. I spent my Thursday at uh, at Umsies and my Friday on uh, the boat with John touring Thomas Point Lighthouse after I was at Cirque for the morning.
Yeah, John, maybe type it into the chat. Any other questions as we wind down here with Senator Elfrith? Elf I know, it's a tongue twister for some reason. All right, I'll ask a quick question and, and you know, pair it with an observation. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I'm Jeff Schomig. I'm on the board of the Severn River Association. And uh, it happened that right before joining this, uh, my previous video meeting was with uh, Senator Van Halen. Um, talking about uh, sort of the, uh, you know, a, a number of a number of strategic issues related to the state of Maryland, you know, with the overall theme to not take Maryland for granted as a yeah. blue state, uh, but also ways to connect across, you know, with independents, Republicans. And, you know, my observation in, in you know, dealing with the Severn River Association issues is that one of the bridge issues uh, that I think is is maybe, and you, you hit upon it a bit, but perhaps we don't discuss it enough, is forest conservation and forest mm -hmm. laws. Yeah. Uh, I think as we know, particularly particularly the current demographics of the Republican Party is it tends to be more rural. Um, uh, people hunt, do outdoor activities, and that's something that I've found in my Republican friends is that, uh, you know, they are really upset and worked up about the amount of forest loss that they yeah. see around them every day. And that's particularly true in the Severn watershed. I think there's there's scarcely a stand of woods in our watershed that isn't marked for development. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I know that you're looking at the statewide, but at, within the Severn River watershed, are there opportunities um, to identify forests, preserve, or not just forests, but open areas, natural areas, yeah and to preserve them uh, both for public access to the river and also simply just to preserve what little uh, forest cover and natural space we have left in the watershed. It's a, Jeff, I, thank you so much because I also forgot that issue. So I can tell the group now, um, I might have misrepresented something to the governor in the last budget to get him to fund the Co Forest Conservation Act study that we've all been waiting for. This group knows we passed the bill in 2019. It went unfunded um, and then we kind of suggested to the governor in a in a sly letter that he put this money in there and he did so the good news jeff is that we are going to have um the technical study done from the chesapeake from chesapeake conservancy in january of forest lost across the state um which is really exciting the bad news is it's an election year which means it's going to be a difficult thing to get across the finish line even though we've been waiting since 1992 to beef this up the good news is we're going to have that study in hand. We're going to start the conversation this year. We're going to make it an election issue. And then uh, my, if I'm a betting person, we would come back in the next term and tackle it. The other good news is that this group knows Annapolis, Anne Arundel County, um, Howard County, Frederick. We're seeing these counties make movement on this incredibly important issue. And that's going to help us at the statewide level increase the, the FCA there. So we'll, we'll make movement. But Jeffrey, your your point about um, you know, not and I've tried to say this in our 30 by 30 legislation, not all land is as equally um ecologically valuable. And we really need to focus our preservation efforts on, to your point, the forested land closest to watersheds. Um, so that's part of our goal with 30 by 30 is is to do that and then create again that flexible bridge funding on acquisition because program open space takes a very long time in the bureaucracy to actually acquire land and you know it's going to go up in value and we're going to lose all this stuff um so creating more um flexible opportunities to acquire and preserve is is top of mind for us and and your point i couldn't agree with you more i knocked on a door four years ago and someone said you know the chesapeake bay is so nonpartisan; it's almost a religion and i do think that that is the bridge between between us um that we just need to focus on. I was I spent um, a, a good bit of time today after Baltimore um, bringing Westmore around the district, um, and that was my message to him too. Was that you know it's it's a really challenging time to be an elected official because you can very easily be divisive, but it's our job to talk in terms of values and shared values and build bridges from there. So you're spot on. Thank you. Oh, John, we can't hear you. I'm so sorry. I'm sure it's something about the lighthouse and how wonderful the lighthouse is and how uh, 
we are working to help John and his team preserve that. Was that what I, what you were gonna say, John? Yeah. <laughs> he was kind of John and, and Captain Howard were kind enough to bring us out. Uh, I brought my the chair of the budget committee out on Friday, um, and John made a very um, successful case for why the state needs to step up again and help them with their work. So I feel good about that budget item this year. Yes. And yeah, Sarah, as you were saying, like I remember when I attended uh, Oyster Advisory Commission meetings back when I was with ORP, like it got very heated. Like, you know, everyone, <laughs> the common thing is everyone wants more oysters in the Bay. They just want them in the Bay for entirely different reasons. Um, so yeah, if we can go back to a baseline of bringing people together on their interest in the Bay, and then maybe some grassroots come out from that, that um, we can uh, connect dots and, and have a bridge, like you said, for the Bay. So can, Brent, can I tell you something really um, eye opening from the OAC? And this is straight from Dr. Wilberg from OMSI's. That was pretty shocking to me. Um, they've modeled it. And if we were to do a, a total moratorium on wild harvest tomorrow, Dr. Wilberg and many of the advocates do not believe oyster populations are going to rebound. Um, so that's not the policy position we need to take. We need to take a policy position of we need to thoroughly invest in our sanctuaries and invest in aquaculture and, you know, allow the working watermen to, you know, fish to the degree that is sustainable and no more. But we, we need to build, to your point, Brian, this entire system out for it to be successful. But um, if, if we were to turn every spigot off right now, the oyster's not coming back. It needs a lot of love and a lot of attention. And that's, you know, I'm so thankful to this group for spending so much of your time, treasure, and talent on on doing that for the Severn. So thank you. Yeah, I mean it's it's not a singular prong attack. Like over harvesting is one of the things, but it's also hugely the degraded water quality with you know nutrient sediment runoff and that riparian forested buffer of the watersheds is a huge thing that we need to protect. And then disease and predation. So yeah, it goes way beyond stopping watermen from um, taking more oysters than we have available. It's it's right. many layers and unfortunately very political. Right. Well, um, I'm sorry I have to jump off uh, for South County, um, but I, I so appreciate the work of this group um, and thank you for spending, I think it's Tuesday, your Tuesday evening with me um, and for all of your support in, in our work at the State House and your work in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanksgiving. We're off in December. Enjoy your holidays, and we'll be coming at you with more great stuff in 2022. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dylan. Thank Thanks, you, Tom. Right board. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you yeah. all for coming. Thanks, Dylan. Good night, everybody. You want to turn off the record?